Hello everybody, this is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Uh, this video is part 10 of my series, The Bible Says. So, this is the last video of the series. <clears throat> it's the grand finale, <clears throat> the conclusion. <clears throat> but if you just stumbled across this video, uh, I just ask that you go back and watch this entire series from the beginning. Um, I believe this is probably the most important uh, series I've ever uh, produced. So I hope you will watch it all and consider it all. But at the end of the last video, I showed how uh, we as Christians can actually choose to uh, grow into mature, productive Christians. There are things that we can actively do in order to promote that, that growth. And uh, that was explained in the last video. But I think that kind of begs the question, well, why? Why should we even care about becoming productive Christians? Um, well, I'll, I'll answer that question as we go along. But let me start off by saying that uh, uh, you are a minister. If you put your faith in Jesus Christ, as I've uh, explained throughout this series, and you're born again, uh, you, you are a minister. Um, so I, I think the first thing you need to do is ask God to reveal to you what is your ministry. We're all called into the ministry, but we're not all called to do exactly the same things because the, the church is called the body of Christ. The Bible says that uh, the body has many parts. So you may not be called to do the same thing I'm called to do. So pray, ask God to reveal to you what he wants you to do, and then get real busy doing it. Uh, let's look at James 4.14 4, first. Whereas ye know not what shall be on the morrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. So uh, I, I think uh, it, it is uh, one of the most profound things about life is um, recognizing that it is inevitable that we're all going to die. And that's why it says here in James is that uh, life's like a vapor. It appears for a short time and it disappears. And, you know, you're, you're going along through life and before you know it, you're old and it's, it's ending. Uh, Hebrews 9.27 says, And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. <laughs> There's a lot of questions that people ask uh, as they... Um, as their life progresses and they, they start taking things more seriously, they ask profound questions. Uh, what is the purpose of life? What happens after we die? And the answers to all those questions are in the Bible. But in Hebrews 9, 27, it, it tells us that uh, everybody must die once. And after that, we will be judged by God. There is a judgment. And probably a lot of people, religious and not so religious, uh, they imagine that someday God will judge them. Uh, but most people don't know that there are two distinct separate judgments. Uh, let's look at Acts 24, 15. And have hope toward God, which they themselves also allow, that there shall be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and unjust. Uh, the term just and unjust uh, just means that the people who are going to go to heaven and the people who won't. Just is based uh, on the word uh, justice and, or justified. Um, the, uh, I am justified in God's sight. Uh, God looks at me just as if I'd never sinned, justified. So when we put our faith in Jesus, uh, God sees us just as if we've never sinned. 
and uh, that's why we get to go to heaven. Um, but the, the other people, the vast majority of people, they would be classified as the unjust. They're not justified. They never put their faith in Jesus. Uh, so there are separate judgments for these two groups of people. Look at John 3.18. He that believeth on him is not condemned. But he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Okay, the name of the only begotten Son of God, of course, is Jesus Christ. And if you have not believed on the name of Jesus Christ for your salvation, if you don't believe Jesus is your Savior, if you don't believe that uh, Jesus uh, is going to give you eternal life, and it's guaranteed uh, because he promised it, and he's God, and God doesn't break his promises. So if you're someone who uh, believes this, then it says here, you are not condemned. But the people who never put their faith in Jesus, they stand already condemned. Our natural state of humanity is that of con being condemned. You know, I, I, I told you at the beginning of this series that man is born with two problems. The problem was sin, but Jesus paid for all our sins. Uh, and the problem of death. We're all, we all have a death sentence on us. And um, you can have this death sentence re removed from you and instead the gift of eternal life by putting your faith in Jesus. But you can see here in John 3.18, there are, again, it clarifies that there are two groups, the just, the unjust, the, 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 the condemned, and the uh, not condemned. Uh, but first let's look at the judgment for those people who uh, are condemned, who never put their faith in Jesus. So if you're watching this now, you've never put your complete faith in Jesus and believe his promise that you're going to go to heaven strictly because of what he did for you by paying for your sins and promising you eternal life. Uh, if you've never done that, th this portion applies to you. Um, this is called the great white throne judgment. Matthew 20, uh, 7, 22, Jesus in his earthly ministry, he talked, he uses this uh, to tell us the day will come where this is going to happen. So Jesus says, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils. And in thy name done many wonderful works. And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. So this is a scenario for all those people who never put their faith in Jesus, but went to the judgment believing in uh, themselves, believing that they could plead their case to Jesus and say, look at all the things I did. Don't I deserve heaven? And he, he says to all those people, depart from me. I never knew you. So uh, if you're that person, Jesus is saying you are unwelcome and you're shunned. Uh, look at John 3.16, maybe the most famous verse in the Bible. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So let's imagine that this person that never put their faith in Jesus is at this great white throne judgment, and they are pleading their case as we saw in the, this example that Jesus gave us. They're pleading all the wonderful things that they've done in their life. And, um, and then they're, uh, they're not welcome in heaven. They, uh, well, John 3.16 should let these people know, look, you need to understand, God loved you so much. The Bible even says God commended his love towards you. In that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Do you understand here? This is the great white throne judgment. This is Jesus talking to them. Do you understand that God loved you so much 
that he sent his only begotten son. That's me, Jesus Christ, the son of God. He sent me to pay for your sins on that cross. And I did it. I completed the job, sin that was paid for. But you would not believe in me. Even though your sins are all paid for, you would not believe in me. So in John 3, 16, it says there's two possibilities for humanity. It says, whoever believeth in him should not perish, but instead have everlasting life. Remember earlier in this series, I said that uh, uh, man is born mortal. Uh, he doesn't naturally live forever. We're not natural, uh, naturally born immortals, but we can become immortal. The Bible says we can put on immortality by believing in Jesus. So John 3.16 says, is saying, you can have everlasting life if you believe in the Son of God, Jesus Christ, for your salvation. But if you won't do that, then you, you will perish. Perish means that you just no longer exist. Look at Matthew 10.28. And fear not them which kill the body but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. This is Jesus speaking. And he's saying, well, you're, you're all afraid of people who can kill your body. Well, that's natural. That's a natural intelligent fear that someone might kill your body. But you really should be more concerned about what it's going to happen to your body and your soul. There is someone who can destroy both your body and your soul in hell. That's God. So um, in John 3.16, it says that the lost will perish. In Matthew 10.28, uh, it, it says that they, their body and their soul will be destroyed. Um, so while this uh, judgment at the Great White Throne uh, is, is taking place and they're face to face with Jesus and it becomes clear to them that Jesus paid for all my sins over and over again through my life. People came to me and told me about you can have eternal life if you put your faith in Jesus. You know, it's offered as a free gift. The wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. People told me that over and over again in my life, and I kept rejecting it. Imagine the anguish and the torment they, they have at that time, realizing that they continually rejected Jesus and the free gift of eternal life. And so there, here they are, knowing that their fate is destruction of both body and soul. Revelation 20, 14 says, And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Well, before there could be a second death, it's logically required that there must be a first death. Uh, so the, the first death is our mortality. Uh, maybe 70 years go by and then we die, more or less. Uh, we all know that's, that's coming. That's inevitable that's expected but most people don't realize that there is a second death too uh, there's a clever saying that i heard years ago it says if you're born once you will die twice but if you're born twice you'll only die once and the the born born twice means that you're born from your mother's womb and then at some point in your life you put your faith in jesus and you're born again, a second time, spiritually. The new birth, born again, child of God. Uh, that's the second birth. Uh, but if someone doesn't ever have the, the second birth, they're only born naturally, but not spiritually, uh, then they end up dying. And then, you'll see what's going to happen here, there will be a resurrection and a judgment and a second death. Um, but this point verse here is saying that death and hell 
and the, the, the uh, unbeliever, they're all cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. That's where destruction of both body and soul takes place. Um, so at that time, the, the death sentence is, is carried out. Um, I think it's important for us to understand that in the, uh, um, the, the first part of the Bible called the, the Old Testament, much of it is based upon uh, the nation of Israel and the religion of Judaism, the laws given to Moses. And uh, in, in all of that, all those laws, that system that God established with Moses and Israel, uh, there is no such thing as being um, a punishment of torture. There's no such thing as a, a punishment of imprisonment. It doesn't exist in Judaism. There's no imprisonment. There's no torture. But some people want to believe that God's going to imprison people in, quote, hell forever and ever and torture them, torment them forever and ever. But that was not the case. That's not the system that God laid out for Israel in, um, in uh, Judaism. What was common, and what some people could argue, is maybe it was too much. They were too quick to give the death sentence, capital punishment, uh, even for some things that we might look at and say, well, that seems like a minor sin, a minor offense, and yet death by stoning. So um, God uses capital punishment, the death sentence. He doesn't use torture and imprisonment. So that's what happens here. The second death is the capital punishment. And at that time, the lost, the, 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 the condemned, the unbelievers, um, th these people had this sentence carried out. Uh, they're mortal, so uh, they can't live forever. They never received the gift of eternal life. I received the gift of eternal life. Uh, uh, I'm going to have a bodily resurrection and, and, and be uh, uh, live forever um, because I put my faith in Jesus. I, I had eternal life. But those people who would not receive the gift of eternal life, they're at the judgment knowing that they're not immortal. They're going to die. I believe they they die right then. And then they're put into the lake of fire just to exterminate them, just to distinguish them, to uh, uh, annihilate them. So they, they actually perish and no longer exist to the dis disposal of both body and, and soul. Um, let's look at now the, um, the uh, judgment seat of Christ. Uh, remember, we, we said in one of these verses earlier that there would be a resurrection of the just and the unjust. So at some point, at the, at the end of his story, that's the end of history, history will play out, and at the end of history, he will return, and he will call out, and there will be a bodily resurrection of every person who's ever lived. The unjust to be raised to go to that judgment and be suffer the second death, and the justified, those who put their faith in Jesus, raised to life everlasting, but also to be judged. But we who put our faith in Jesus will not be judged uh, for eternal life or our place in heaven. That's already determined. We are going to heaven. We do have eternal life. We will be judged based upon what we did with our ministry. Remember I said earlier, when you put your faith in Jesus, you become a minister, a servant of God. And your ministry runs from your, the, from your new birth, from that moment, until your last breath. There's a record of all the things you did that God will, could value. And uh, you will be rewarded for those things. So if you're asking, well, why should I work in a ministry? Why do I need to do that? Uh, there is a merit system in heaven. You don't... You don't do good things in order to get go to heaven as a reward. You go to heaven because it's a gift offered by Jesus. But once we have this standing before God that we're righteous, 
we're considered holy, we're guaranteed eternal life in heaven, then we are on the merit system in our ministry. How well you do in your ministry will make all the difference uh, in, in eternity. And let's look now at that particular judgment called the judgment seat of Christ. <clears throat> um, Matthew 6, 19 says, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moths and vermin destroy, uh, and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where moths and rust do not destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So this is Jesus speaking again. And he's, he's telling all of us, um, you can build up for yourself treasures in heaven. And, and that's where your, your uh, ambition should be. That's where your thoughts, your goals, your effort should be towards that end. Not towards earning your salvation. That's impossible. Not towards building up uh, riches on earth uh, and recognition from man uh, in becoming famous. No. Do the things that God will value so that you get treasures in heaven because these are eternal rewards. If you're wise, you'll focus on treasures in heaven instead of treasures on earth. 1 Corinthians 3, 11 through 15, the Apostle Paul writes, For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. So, before any of this applies to you, you first have to have this foundation of Jesus Christ. The first foremost thing must happen. You must put your faith in Jesus. You must be born again. And uh, if once that happens, now your ministry begins. Now this applies to you. Now, if any man build up upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest. Uh, so obviously, uh, we build on the foundation of Jesus uh, with our with our ministry works, and we could be building things that are valued like gold and silver and precious stones, or we could be building things that really have no value like wood, hay, and stubble. Uh, it says every man's work shall be made manifest. So at that judgment, every person, all the works we did in our ministry will be made manifest for everybody to see. For the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. So imagine that it was take, possible to take a good deed that you did with the right intentions, uh, and, and somehow turn that into a material object, like wood, hay, or stubble, or a precious gem. And... and uh, uh, if it's good, done with the right intentions, uh, and, and, and if it's something that God would, would value, then uh, when it's put in this fire, it's not burned up in the fire like wood here and stubble would be burned. If you're spending your time doing things that God does not value, and, when, and it's put in the fire, it's burned up and nothing, nothing but ashes. There's no treasure for you. But if you're spending your time in your ministry doing things that God values, and I think you can just understand what he would value and what he wouldn't. Part of it is what you do and part of it is why you did it. Uh, it says, if any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. So there is a merit system. There is a reward system for all of us who are going to heaven. Um, if any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss. So of all your works you're doing in your ministry that maybe you, you think are good and God doesn't value them, it's burned up. There's nothing. But it says, so, but your, your works of no value may be burned up. But, and, and so you'll, you'll suffer loss, a loss of, of reward. But he himself shall be saved. So in other words, you remain saved. Your standing is a saved, born-again Christian with, who has the gift of eternal life. 
uh, your standing as a child of God, uh, that standing is not affected by this judgment. Only gaining or losing rewards is, is determined at this judgment. Um, now let's look at the next thing that's going to happen. 2 Peter 3.12 As you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming, that day will bring about the destruction of the heavens by fire. The heavens, um, the Bible uses the, heaven, the word heaven three ways. Um, uh, heavens could be all of creation and including all of the universe. That's the heavens. Uh, uh, the, the area surrounding the earth and beyond. Uh, then, the, uh, then there's also the heaven, which is the location of God's throne. And uh, in this case, it says all of the heavens, destruction of the heavens, everything is going to be burned up and destroyed by fire. And it says, and the elements will melt in the heat. Um, it says it with fervent heat. So this is telling us that after this judgment is done the, and the lost are put into the lake of fire and destroyed and that the, the saved, the believers in Jesus are judged and, and for their rewards, the next thing that happened is God's going to destroy the entire universe, all of creation with fire. It'll all be burned up and melt away. But in keeping with his promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness dwells. So all of creation will be destroyed and then the universe, the heavens and the new earth recreated. Revelation 21.3 says, And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. For the old order of things has passed away. That's one of the greatest portions of Scripture, this promise that all these things that we dread are going to be removed forever. In this new creation, the new heavens and the new earth, we won't have those things. And it says, he who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. And in 1 Corinthians 2.9, Paul writes, But as it is written, I have not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. So the Bible says that nobody's even seen or heard or could even imagine the wonderful things God has prepared for us who love him in heaven, on the new earth, throughout eternity. That's what we have to look forward to. And all because of our great Savior God, Jesus. All right. Well, that concludes this series, The Bible Says. Uh, if, as I said, if you haven't watched it from the beginning, please start with part one and work your way through it. Every video of the 10 is, is important. Um, so, so thank you for watching. I look forward to your comments and I, I, I urge you to share this 
this playlist with everybody you can. Bless you all in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus.